Reading this morning from the book of Genesis, chapter 8, and from verse 15. Genesis, chapter 8, from verse 15, and reading into chapter 9. Let's hear the word of God. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons, and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out, and his sons and his wife, and his sons' wives with him. Every animal, every creeping thing, every bird, And whatever creeps on the earth, according to their families, went out of the ark. Then Noah built an an altar to the Lord, and took of every clean animal and every clean, clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, on all that move on the earth, and on all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood." Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it, and from the hand of man. From the hand of every man's brother I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply in it. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you, for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud And I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word to us. We could hardly have sung a better hymn as an introduction to the theme that we are turning to this morning in our studies in Genesis. We've sung of the God of the Covenant, and that's the central theme of Genesis 8, 15, uh, and into chapter 9. We've already seen how God's dealings with Noah can be summarized in what becomes a very familiar triad uh, in the Scriptures, which is sin, judgment, and salvation. 
There is a sense in which that triad is the theme of the whole of the Bible. Sin, as it increases and spreads following the fall, judgment that God visits upon sin, and salvation as God seeks to save and keep his people. Now we're beginning uh, today at the point at which God has passed judgment on the sin of mankind. It has received the just condemnation that comes from the broken heart of God, whose heart grieves over the sin of man and the terrible consequences that follow in the wake of man's sin. And so God pronounces a sentence upon man and the precise judgment falls on Noah's generation. The the judgment is this, I will destroy, or the sentence is this, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them, God says in chapter 6 and verse 7. And then in chapter 7 and verse 21, we read, And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every man. The precise judgment that God pronounced was carried out. And now we come to chapter 8 and verse 15 and following, where God comes to fulfill the covenant which he made with Noah in chapter 6 and verse 18, where he says, and this is God the Saviour speaking to Noah, who has found grace in his sight, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark. And the covenant that God made with Noah concerning concerned the ark that he would build, and the safety from the judgment that he would find in the ark. And now in chapter 8 and verse 15, God brings Noah out of the ark and into the new world that lies before him in the aftermath of the judgment. And what Noah must have seen when he came out of the ark. Now I know that many of you here will have been through Sunday school or you will have seen pictures of Noah coming out of the ark and there's the ark on a lovely green hill and there's trees and there's birds and there's all lovely animals and he builds his altar. It wasn't like that. What you need to think about is the tsunami that hit Japan a few years ago. You need to think about the tsunami that hit Indonesia a decade ago. The devastation. That's what Noah saw when he came out of the ark that day. It wasn't a lovely sight that met Noah's eyes at all. He saw devastation the debris that was left after this horrendous judgment that God had brought on the earth that destroyed all living things on the face of the earth. And perhaps we can imagine then Noah's thoughts as he stepped out of the ark, out of the darkness into the sunlight of a new day in a new world. He must have been overawed by a sense of God's holiness. A holiness that was so provoked by human sin uh, that he could only respond with such a terrible judgment that brought such devastation upon the earth. Noah must have marveled at that, the fearful, wonderful holiness of God. And he must have been astonished also by the mercy of God. Mercy that had saved him and his family and all the creatures that were on the ark from the devastation of this divine judgment that had come on the earth. Noah must have been amazed to walk out into a new world and see the results of the provoked holiness of God, the aftermath of his divine judgment, and contemplate the amazing mercy of God towards him and his family in such a place. Because Noah, you see, deserved nothing more from the hand of God, nothing different from what everyone else had received in that generation. Noah wasn't saved because there was anything particular or special about him. It was only that he found grace in the sight of God. And Noah must have marveled at that. And another thing that must have been in his spirit as he walked out of the ark into that new world there must have been an enormous awareness of the debt that he owed to God. And from his soul, thanks must have risen to God as he looked at the devastation of judgment around him and realized that he had been spared only by God's mercy. And for the rest of his days, he must have felt a debt of praise and thankfulness to God for the life 
that he owed to God because of God's mercy, and he would have realized he could never repay that debt. So it's not surprising that the first thing that Noah does when he emerges from the ark is to build again, but not now an ark, an altar. Chapter 8 and verse 20, Noah built an altar to the Lord. Noah built an altar to the Lord. So on this new dry ground upon which Noah stands, he makes a place of sacrifice, of offering, of devotion, of dedication to God. And everything uh, that had been saved of every creature on the ark, clean animal, he brings a representative of everything that had been delivered from that judgment and brings it and lays it on the altar. It's a wonderful picture, you see. It's a wonderful picture of all who have tasted and known the grace and the mercy of God. Everyone who has experienced God's grace thereafter builds an altar in their life and they realize that all that they have and all that they are redeemed by God must be offered to God in joyful thanksgiving and sacrifice to him. And did you notice that though we read in chapter 6 and verse 6 that when God saw the sin of man his heart was filled with pain and it grieved him. In chapter 8 and verse 21 we read that the savour of Noah's sacrifice came up to God and it filled him with pleasure. Now there's a threefold significance in scripture to burnt offerings. They speak of thanksgiving. Noah's soul was surely full of thanksgiving and burnt offerings speak of dedication and Noah wanted his life now, his new life on a new earth to be given entirely to God and they speak also of atonement, that is of making an offering for sin because the simple lesson or reason that Noah had uh, learned was that as a sinner he needs some means by which sin is dealt with and so we might escape the judgment of God because although in one sense Noah stands here as a new man in a new world and stands on the threshold as it were of a new age it's a new start as it were some have suggested at this point that Noah is like a second Adam uh, in chapter 9 and verse 1 God speaks to Noah in the same way that he spoke to Adam, you remember. God blessed Noah and his sons and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And some reading that say, well, here's Noah after the flood, after the judgment, standing in a new world and standing as God's new man. He's like a second Adam. Christ is the last Adam. But some think Noah is a second Adam, standing at the beginning of a new and a fresh start. And continuing in chapter 9, you see that God gives to Noah uh, dominion over all creation, as he gave to Adam. And yet, although that is true, all that is true, it's also true that Noah and his descendants are sinners. Still sinners. Notice how that's brought out in verse 21 of chapter 8. The Lord smelled a soothing aroma, and the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. That's God speaking about man after the flood. And it's better translated, Never again will I curse the ground for man's sake, even though the intention of his heart is evil from his youth. This is man after the judgment of the flood. Here is Noah on the first day of the new world that he's stepped into, and God says of him and of his descendants, they are as they were before the flood came. Every inclination of their heart is evil continually from childhood. That is, as the Lord Jesus was to say later, evil comes from within. It is within the heart of man. And it's there from childhood. It is heart evil. It is inherited evil. 
That's man's condition. That is Noah's condition. So if people hope to see a new Adam, as it were, in Noah, then they're going to be disappointed. And if they don't recognize that Noah is a sinner in chapter 8, they soon will when they get into chapter 9 and they see Noah's shame displayed. Adam, the first Adam, is created perfect by God. Yet across his life, we can write the word failure. Noah, if we think of him as a second Adam, across his life, we write the word failure. And every man brought into the world right down through the running centuries to our own. Across their lives, you write the word failure. Until we come to the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our ark of safety from the coming judgment, and more still, to renew in us the image of God and to bring us the glories of his covenanted mercies in all their fullness. So here at this point now then in chapter 8, God is revealing to Noah his covenant. He's going to fulfill this purpose to withhold and to restrain judgment, he says. Verse 21, the Lord smelled a soothing aroma and the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. God is promising there to all mankind represented in Noah, that he is going to forbear, he will hold back and restrain his judgment. He will delay, he says, the day of reckoning until the day when the messenger of the covenant has come and salvation is purchased through his blood. So God fixes his eyes, as it were, fixes his eye upon a coming day. And here to Noah, he announces his judgment of the world is postponed until the end, until the last day. And he does so for this specific purpose, as we shall see. But that leads to the very core of this passage and the core of its message to us, which is about God making this covenant with Noah. Notice how frequently you see the word covenant in chapter 9. Look at verse uh, 8. God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, As for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, every beast of the earth with you, and all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for the sign of the covenant. And it continues a number of times further. He makes reference to this covenant. Now in chapter 6, God has already covenanted with Noah. It's the first time that the word covenant appears in Scripture when he says, I'll establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark, and so on. And now he covenants with Noah that he will sustain the earth and restrain judgment so long as the earth continues. So God is setting out for Noah his purpose for the future of the world and the earth. And it centers upon the fact that God makes and keeps this covenant. Now, this is one of the most important things for us to grasp as we study Scripture, because I think no one can really properly understand biblical religion and interpret Scripture correctly without understanding what the Bible means when it uses this term covenant. The God of the Bible is a God who makes and keeps covenant with his people, and the people of God are his covenant people. The religion of the Bible is a covenant religion. And the messenger, or the Messiah, I should say, is, Malachi calls him, the messenger of the covenant. And so when Jesus comes, he comes to seal the new covenant in his blood. And his blood is the blood of the covenant. It runs right through the scriptures. Throughout the whole of the scriptures, you see that God deals with us through covenant that he makes. So when John the Baptist was born, months before the Saviour came into the world, you remember his father Zacharias 
cried out, God has remembered his covenant. And that's the real significance of John's birth and of Jesus coming into the world. Now the basic thought behind the idea of covenant in Scripture is the thought of God bringing men and women into relationship with himself so that he can freely give to them the riches of his grace. Covenant means God seeking men and women, bringing them into a relationship with himself, and in that relationship, bestowing upon them the riches of his grace and glory. So God comes to us and says, I will be your God, and you will be my people. It is God establishing that relationship, a saving relationship, with people like us. And he does that by means of a covenant. Now we see in Scripture that God makes covenant with men at various, various stages in Bible history. He came to Abraham, you remember, in Genesis 15 and made a covenant with him. He comes to Moses in the book of Exodus. He comes to David in 2 Samuel 7 and so on. But there is a special significance about this covenant that God makes with Noah, especially when it comes to understanding what covenant means. Professor John Murray says that the covenant with Noah shows us more clearly than any other what a covenant is when God makes a covenant. So we learn here four things, four important things about covenant from uh, this covenant that God makes with Noah. And the first concerns the author of God's covenant. You see in verse 8 and 9 of chapter 9, the author of the covenant is God, exclusively and only God. Then God spoke to Noah and his sons with him, saying, As for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. And if you read on in verses uh, 10, 11, and 12, you'll see that the covenant that God makes with Noah is conceived and devised and established and sealed by God alone. In other words, God's covenant is a unilateral covenant. That is, it is one-sided. A unilateral decision is a decision when God decides something and, uh, or when someone decides something and acts without consulting with anyone else. We say that's a unilateral decision that person has taken. And a unilateral covenant is what happens when God establishes his relation, this relationship with people without consulting anyone, without asking for their co cooperation, without even asking for their agreement, and without asking for their help. It is a unilateral thing. God just imposes it. And so it comes unilaterally and solely from God alone. In other words, God doesn't wait for us to desire his grace. And how we should thank God that he doesn't do that. He doesn't wait for us to desire his grace. Have you ever blessed God for that? glorious fact that God doesn't wait for you to desire his grace before he says I will be your God and you will be my people he does not come and ask us how we would like to receive his grace or on what basis his grace should come to us and his salvation and then negotiate with us some agreement no, he comes unilaterally and he imposes his covenant saying, this is the covenant that I have established with you. And this is what we mean then when we say that God's grace in salvation is sovereign grace. It is God. It is God alone who exercises it. Now, we can sometimes be misled by the term covenant because outside of scripture it's used in a different way. We speak, for example, of the marriage covenant, don't we? And in the marriage covenant, there is a, an agreement reached between two individual parties. It's not a unilateral decision. Some people might wish that it was, but it's not. And so in the marriage service, 
the bride and the groom are asked, Will you? Will you? Do you? Do you? Both have to agree. Marriage is not a unilateral covenant, but God's covenant is unilateral. It doesn't depend upon any discussion or deliberation before the agreement is made. It depends entirely upon God establishing this covenant with his people entirely on his terms. It's more akin to what's known as the suzerain treaties of the ancient Near East, when a victor stood over the vanquished foe, as it were, with his sword to his throat and said to him, these are the terms of the covenant that I'm going to establish with you. And the vanquished had no option but to accept. That's how it is when God makes covenant with people. And we should bless God that he doesn't wait for us to desire his grace before he bestows his grace on us. So the author of the covenant is God. And the covenant is unilaterally imposed. It's a sovereign act of God's grace. The next important thing to see here is the basis of God's covenant. And it's important to notice that when God enters into covenant with Noah, either in chapter 6 or in chapter 9, he didn't do so because of any quality that he saw in Noah. The people with whom God enters into covenant are still sinners, still rebels, as chapter 8 verse 21 so clearly shows us. We are sinners by inner inclination, we are sinners by inherited tendency, we are sinners by imputation. So God's desire to be in a relationship with men is not a response to any goodness that he sees in us. In fact, it is precisely the reverse of that. It is undeserved mercy towards sinners. It is positively demerited mercy towards sinners. And every covenant God makes in the Bible is made on that basis. He's coming to sinners. It is always on the basis of grace. It is always made on the basis of undeserved mercy. And those with whom God makes covenant are, in other words or in the words of the hymnist, debtors to mercy alone. They've nothing else to offer God but their sins. And that's the basis on which God deals with sinners. And it's important for me to point, uh, to pause at this moment and to ask you if you're clear about that as God's way of salvation. That it comes on the basis of grace. That you don't offer anything to God but your sins. You've got nothing else to bring him but sins, and he meets that with mercy and with grace. Only on that basis do people enter in, into God's kingdom. In other words, God doesn't wait for you to improve your tawdry little life and change the condition of your soul and heart before he will be gracious to you. He doesn't ask you to make yourself more acceptable to him. God be praised that he doesn't ask for such a thing, but is gracious to sinners. But perhaps you may be continuing under a, a misunderstanding of God's way of salvation. And you could be thinking that somehow salvation is tied to your personal righteousness and goodness. And that somehow it's dependent on you, that you've got to do something. Your good works, your performance. What Noah discovers here, and praise God it's true, is that God makes a unilateral covenant with men. It is sovereignly given. He binds it to them in a covenant by which they become his people and he becomes God to them. And he does that on the basis of pure, undeserved mercy and grace. But then having said that, you see here that is, though the covenant isn't established on the basis of human merit, it is related in chapter 8 to the sacrificial altar. Noah's altar. Just look at chapter 8 and verse 20. Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings to, on the altar and the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart. Now remember that the idea of burnt offering in scripture, there's a note of atonement attached to it, that is making an offering designed to turn or to 
cover sin and to turn away anger. And you read there in verse 21 that the Lord smelled the aroma and the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse, and so on. The words of the covenant that he makes with, with Noah. Now God, savouring the sacrifice and being pleased with it, is just another way of saying he accepted it. It was acceptable to him. And immediately he covenants with a fallen race of man represented by Noah and his family. Now when God's covenant of grace is fully revealed, not now in Old Testament shadows, but in realities, the New Testament realities, it was on the basis not of human merit, but on the basis of the shed blood of the Lamb of God, the first sacrifice that was sufficient to take away sin. And on that basis of the blood of the new covenant, as the Lord Jesus describes it, God is covenanting with his people that he will take away their sins, that he will be their God, that they will be his people, so that all the covenant mercies and blessings are related to the blood that is shed on the altar of Calvary by the one who came as the messenger of the new covenant. This, says Jesus, is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And he died in order to secure the blessings of the covenant that God made in shadow to Noah, gave more light to Moses and more light to David and so on, until Christ himself comes, the messenger of the covenant. And Zacharias says, God has remembered his covenant with Abraham and the blessings of God's covenant with Abraham have come upon the Gentiles by faith as the Apostle Paul says. So the basis is grace. The third thing then is this blessing, the blessing of the covenant. Chapter 9 and verse 11. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off from the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Now again, we need to notice that in Scripture, covenant is almost always synonymous with blessing and promise. Because when God comes to his people, he comes to bestow his riches upon those upon whom he has set his love. And he comes to bestow boundless riches upon us and makes promises to us. And all those promises are wrapped up in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what God promises Noah here is a foreshadowing and a token of that. Here he promises to restrain his judgment, to never again bring a global judgment upon the earth until the world as we know it reaches its end. Why? Why is that so? Why does God make this promise? Well, it's because he has purposed to send his only begotten Son. And in the fullness of time, when he comes, the blessings of the covenant in all their fullness are brought to men and women and boys and girls. Here's the blessing then of divine forbearance. And all creation is involved in this divine forbearance so that you and I, as you sit in church this morning, as I stand here, we inherit this covenant promise. Do you realize that? It's only because of divine forbearance, his patience and his long-suffering, that the earth continues to this moment. And this is the truth that men and women need to understand today, when they mistakenly think that they can sin and that it doesn't matter, that there's no penalty. When we think back over past sins, and uh, apparently we think God has not judged those sins, we might mistakenly conclude that there is no divine judgment and that there will be no divine judgment. Whereas God has already promised he will restrain his judgment until the last day. And until then, this purpose of divine forbearance is to lead us to repentance. Remember how uh, the Lord speaks through Peter in his second epistle about this very thing. He says, he says this, Know this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, 
that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That is how you inherit this blessing of the covenant that God made with Noah. God is patiently forbearing. He is holding back his judgment his holy judgment until the last day. But that restraint is not going to go on forever. He's holding it back in order to be patient so that all might come to repentance, Peter says. Or as we read here in this word that God gives, while the earth remains. But that promise also has built into it a warning. It is while the earth remains that these things continue, but the earth is not going to remain forever. There will be a day of judgment. But now we're in a period of probation, and God is forbearing with us, and the aim is that we should come to repentance, because that day of, repent, uh, of forbearance will reach its end. So the author of the covenant is God alone. The basis of the covenant is grace alone. The blessing of the covenant are the riches of God in Christ Jesus and the sign of the covenant, briefly uh, to close. The sign of the covenant is the rainbow, verse 12 through 17. I'll just read a few verses. God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and and the earth. And what is a beautiful thing to see, the bow that God has set in the heavens as a reminder, the sign of the covenant, a sign of God's promise. I will remember the covenant, he says, which is between me and you and all living creatures. But it's not put there to remind God as if God is liable to forget. The sign of the rainbow, you see, is a sign for you. And for me, it's a sign to us. It helps to remind us that God remembers, that God does not forget his covenant. He'll not forsake his covenant. He puts a sign there for us, for our sake, so that every time we see the sign, we're reminded that God still remembers his covenant. And he'll not forget his covenant, neither this covenant with Noah nor the covenant that he makes with us in Christ Jesus. God will not forget. Of course, the bow symbolizes other things too. It symbolizes a glorious link between heaven and earth, the symbol of the fact that God is made by, uh, the covenant is made by God and not by men, because the rainbow is made and formed by God and not by men. And then there's that lovely scene you remember in Revelation chapter 4. You might remember that striking picture of the flashing lightning and the blazing glory and majesty of God that streams out of his throne with blinding purity and holiness. But around the throne, you remember, a rainbow. A sign that the throne of God's blinding glory has become for us a sign, a throne of grace in the Lord Jesus. So the covenant that God makes is the ground of our hope as sinners. And the thing which should stimulate gratitude in us and devotion and love to so gracious a God and Lord. God's covenant mercies. Now if you take all those truths and apply them to the new covenant, sealed in the blood of Jesus, you find that the author of the new covenant is God. And the basis of the new covenant is grace alone. And the blessing of the new covenant is found in Christ alone. And the sign of the new covenant is the sacrament of baptism and the Lord's table. Because you see, the new covenant and the old covenant are one covenant. The difference is only in administration. It is all God's grace 
bound up in the Lord Jesus Christ, freely given to undeserving sinners, the riches of God in Jesus. So we glory in God's covenant grace this morning in the fact that our God is a covenant-making God and we rest our hope for eternity upon the amazing grace and mercy of God freely offered to us in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, living then with a constant and a continual sense of indebtedness, I trust, and thanks to the God of holy grace. Amen. The Lord bless his word to us. Let us pray. We thank you, our gracious God, that you are indeed the Father of mercies, that you did not wait for us to desire your grace before you bestowed that grace upon us in the person of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you have made covenant with us, that you've established covenant, that it's a unilateral covenant. We thank you that we can say salvation is of the Lord, and we acknowledge that when we come to the glory of heaven, we shall not sing of our praise, of our worthiness, but we shall sing unto him who has loved us and washed us from our sins. For that is all we could bring to you, our sin and our positive demerit. But we thank you that you meet that with an ocean of grace, of love, of mercy, and you bestow upon us in the Lord Jesus Christ such blessings that presently we cannot comprehend. But we acknowledge even now that though our thanks is, uh, our thanksgiving to you is inadequate, it will be inadequate too even when we reach glory. And therefore, for eternity, we shall spend our days uh, thanking, praising, worshipping the Lamb in the midst of the throne for such grace and mercy. Amen.